Communities Roundtable. I'm Jennifer Jones and I'm delighted to introduce our speakers and to chair this session. Our presenters, as you will see shortly, are exploring a set of questions that French historians have been batting around for almost half a century since Roland Barthes published The Fashion System in uh, 1967, since literary scholar Stephen Greenblatt introduced us to the concept of Renaissance self-fashioning in the 1980s. How did people in the past mark their identities through material objects, especially the spun, woven, or knit fibers, feathers, pelts, gems, and metals that humans use to protect, adorn, and distinguish our bodies? And beyond the individual, how do these material visible objects participate in the social, economic, and cultural practices and systems of faddishness and fashion? In Roland Barthes' striking phrases that as a graduate student early in the 80s, um, I, I read and still resonate with me, fashion is a technique for opening the invisible. Fashion is a kind of machine for making meaning without fixing it. All five of today's presenters in our lightning round presentations breathe fresh life and offer new perspectives on the long-standing historical questions regarding the complex ways in which fashion derives its meanings from the nexus of gender, class, race, sexuality, age, nationality, and politics. Our panelists, as you'll see, richly explore the multiple, contradictory, slippery ways that clothing and fashion assert the individual and offer paths of everyday resistance while also managing to conform to social norms, perpetuate structures of power, and construct a sense of French national identity. I'm delighted to start um, with Julie Landweber, Associate Professor of History and of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at Montclair State University in New Jersey. Uh, she's a Rutgers PhD. I was delighted to serve on her committee uh, many years ago now. Uh, she's a specialist in 17th and 18th century France. Um, she has written a series of path-breaking articles out of her dissertation, French Delight in Turkey, the Impact of Turkery or Identity Construction in 18th Century France, and in the last several years has moved into the history of coffee in France. So, Julie? And having just sat in the, uh, the first session in honor of Jim, uh, Jim Collins last, I'm I don't need that. That's yours. Um, I'm just delighted to have the, the mentor-student relationships that continue. So Jennifer was wonderful working with you all those years ago, and you were very inspirational in terms of me thinking about fashion. So I'm just going to dive right in because we have limited time. When Arabian, when Arabian coffee first came to France in the mid-17th century, it was soon established as more than just a bean or a beverage. Early importers, a mix of merchants, scholars, and diplomats, brought across the Mediterranean their knowledge of an Arab Ottoman coffee culture of associated objects, practices, and drinking spaces. In those same years, other luxury imports from Asia were also coming into vogue, including Chinese porcelain, Japanese lacquerware, Indian calicos, Persian silks, Ottoman sofas, I could go on and on. In addition to these imported goods, new styles of clothing for both men and women also began to appear in the 1660s and 70s, inspired by the contemporary dress of Japan, India, Persia, Armenia, the Ottoman Empire, again, one could go on. Soon bundled together with coffee in the social imagination, these items became nearly inseparable over the next century. Between 1670 and 1700, scarcity and prohibitive prices led ambitious artisans to create domestic versions of these imports using French resources. And then in the early 18th century, entrepreneurs likewise decided to break Yemen's monopoly on coffee production and develop plantations in the French East and West Indian colonies. While I think it makes sense that the earliest French, uh, excuse me, the earliest coffee services manufactured in France would imitate their Ottoman predecessors, and similarly, uh, the first um, fr uh, 
excuse me, let's see, coffee services, right? And then similarly, the first French coffee houses were also based upon foreign models. I find it surprising that a century later, after coffee production had shifted decisively to the Caribbean and the cafe had become a wholly French institution, these Asian themes persisted. So in the course of a book I'm writing on the history of coffee in early modern France, I argue that in the process of adopting coffee, the French imbued it with an Orientalist culture of their own invention. So let's see how that happened. In the 17th century, a wealthy non-aristocratic segment of French society began purchasing goods to assert themselves through taste in new ways. Importers and artisans learned to persuade customers that in order to fully appreciate coffee, they needed to buy more than just the beans. They also needed particular dishes, they needed furniture, they even needed the right clothing. Novel commodities such as coffee that created a miniature culture around their use had the potential to mark the identity of those who consumed them. French coffee drinkers learned to associate this new habit with sensual pleasure and feelings of cosmopolitanism, in short, with a kind of fashioning of the drinker as a knowledgeable, worldly, and stylish person. In the 1670s, with the founding of the news journal, the Le Mercure Galant, the modern fashion plate was born. From the start, a pan-Asian style was central to the new fashion of what the stylish French man and woman should wear and how he or she should behave. Both genders were shown enmeshed within a fashion system based on an eclectic mix of Eastern references. So as this first slide shows, we see men and women sitting on Ottoman beds, on Ottoman canapes, on Ottoman sofas. These are all new furniture concepts borrowed from the Ottoman Empire. We also see them wearing Armenian, Siamese, Ottoman, and Indian robes, or clothes made from fabric that was imported from these places. Often, they're shown with a turbaned Moorish servant for added style. Coffee, imported from Arabia via the Levant, fit right in with this aesthetic. So the earliest French texts on coffee, there's a bunch of them published between 1664 and 1716, collectively established that coffee consumption required a complement of Arab knowledge, Ottoman utensils, and Chinese porcelain dishes. So here, a classic text by Sylvestre du, Philippe Sylvestre Dufour from 1685 uh, shows us an Ottoman Turk who is demonstrating the objects for making and serving coffee. This mixing of practices and objects from across Asia merged seamlessly together with the new Asian-inspired looks. Thus, plates from the 1670s, 80s, and 90s show elegant Frenchmen and women drinking Arabian coffee poured from Ottoman coffee pots into Chinese porcelain cups while sitting on Ottoman sofas and wearing Asian-styled clothing. From the 1720s onward, we're rapidly going, going fast here, moving into the 18th century, coffee drinking scenes develop into a subject for high art in addition to the engraved prints where they had become a staple. Works like these uh, contributed to maintaining coffee's attractiveness among the social elite after fashion plates first launched the trend. Two subgenres emerge. The first of these is the portrait à la Turque, which in turn derived from paintings of actual Turkish women drinking coffee, as you see on the upper left. That's a, uh, an Ottoman uh, miniature made around 1688 in Istanbul. This genre, as it became Europeanized, often developed an overt sexual suggestiveness because the scenes would be set in a seraglio, a harem, or the women would be shown in partial undress. So here we have a sequence with the 1688 miniature inspiring Jean-Baptiste Van Moor, who was a Dutch painter who worked for the French in Istanbul, and I think he must have seen that image because then he paints this painting in 1720. And then uh, uh, Charles-André Van Loo either also saw the Hussein uh, image because it migrated to the uh, Bibliothèque Royale at the end of the 17th century, or he saw Van Moore's painting and was inspired with the very famous painting of uh, Madame de Pompadour shown as a sultana being served coffee. And so you've got the seraglio, you've got undress or partial undress, and you've got <coughs> coffee. Now, here's another sequence in this subgenre. Uh, in 1723, Jean-François de Troyes took a, a private commission to do a pair of paintings, the first of which is a lady taking coffee. 
okay, that's fine. It sat in someone's house. I think that Gautier d'Agoti must have seen it because there are so many similarities between the uh, de Troyes and Agoti's painting of Madame du Berry being presented with a cup of coffee by her Moorish servant, Zamor. We've got the sofas, we've got the uh, déshabille, we have the uh, uh, Chinese porcelain, and they're just in the same pose, as you can see. In 1760, uh, there was a print made uh, of uh, L'Amour Asiatique, which has now become a complete stereotypical trope. Uh, so we've got a sultan making love to a concubine, and their servant is making <coughs> coffee for them to drink. <laughs> and then 19 years later, it's put on a coffee cup, which I think is pretty cute. So we've got love on a coffee cup. This genre demonstrates that coffee remained closely associated with the tropes of turquery and sensuality. Um, and these tropes are actually established back in those plates in the 1680s, but I didn't have time to show you, so take my word for it, please. <laughs> There is another genre that also develops a little bit later into the 18th century, and I think of this as the domestic family scene, and it presents a much more, shall we say, respectable message. So we have uh, a luncheon, uh, Boucher from 1739, Lancre, a lady taking coffee with her children. I think she's actually teaching her children. He's, she's giving them their first taste of coffee from 1742. And then this gentleman, uh, Quatre Mères de Cancy, with his family in 1780, and it's hard to see, but that's coffee right there. So um, what's happening here, I think, is that these paintings are now suggesting that coffee has become an expected element of solid family meals and the proper upbringing of children, at least among the better off, the haute bourgeoisie and above. In the later 18th century, depictions of coffee drinking evolve a third subgenre, what I'm calling the generic fashionable person, usually but not always a woman, associated with what we will call Asian styles, coffee, and sometimes sex. This is almost but not quite a reversion to 17th century ideas. So here we have a literal revival of 17th century fashion plates in the 1780s uh, Galerie des Modes, where uh, the two ones at the top are from the 17th century. You see they just switched the images here. Um, and the only difference here really is that this gentleman uh, was reading a letter and here he's drinking a cup of coffee. We also can see, picking up that last image and bringing it paired with another one, chinoiserie being taken to new levels of fantasy. So both of these plates show uh, people in, uh, he's in a dressing gown, she's in obviously a fashionable dress. They're, um, they're both, fe both of their clothes feature what are called pagoda sleeves and somehow this Chinese reference seems to naturally go with coffee. Coffee could also bypass the Oriental and yet still be linked to sex. This 1785 illustration of the Café du Parnasse shows where uh, we've got beautiful women acting as erotic and inspiring muses to male writers all while drinking coffee. Coffee drinking could also just claim fashion generically. So we return to my opening image of a coffee cup showing a woman drinking coffee. <laughs> Just so circular, I think. Between the 1670s and the 1780s, French consumers learned to think of coffee consumption as one element within an increasingly imaginary pan-Asian style. By the 1780s, coffee is no longer an alien thing, but it is still interpreted by many consumers as part of a larger Orientalist fashion genre. However, in practice, this Asian look was more and more likely to be assembled by individual users out of goods made entirely in France, in the case of clothing and porcelain and furniture, or in its colonies, as in the case of coffee itself. As these dem developments demonstrate, by the 1780s, coffee and its material culture had been thoroughly integrated into French fashion and ideas about fashioning the self. To drink coffee was to be fashionable. Thank you.